Can you walk me through a bit of the phenomenon of cardiac injury during COVID or during a COVID infection? Yeah, this has been something that's been um, hotly debated. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll see where things land as we continue to investigate this phenomenon. But we, we were, again, noting from the uh, anecdotes of care workers on the front lines, both internationally and here, that although COVID is primarily a respiratory problem, um, and that's typically how patients are going to experience symptoms. We were seeing, particularly in the sicker populations in the hospitals and the ICUs, that they would initially have respiratory symptoms, sometimes to the point of needing intubation, and then start to recover, um, maybe even be extubated, and then all of a sudden, clinically, start to show signs of cardiac dysfunction, presenting with uh, decreased EFs, uh, evidence of cardiogenic shock, and in some cases, actually arresting and dying. So all of this made us start to think about, well, although we've been focused on the lungs, is there a cardiac issue that we need to be at pay attention to as well with this virus? We know that the way the virus gets into cells through that ACE2 receptor is certainly through pneumocytes in the lungs, but it appears that it also could be directly affecting the myocardium as well. So there may be a COVID-related myocarditis. Um, we would certainly need to understand that much more and marry it with pathologic data and some of the other diagnostic criteria for myocarditis properly. But one theory is that COVID may directly invade the myocardium. The second theory is that the overall stress that the body encounters when it's fighting COVID infection, even if it's contained to the lungs, can, particularly in patients with pre-existing cardiac disease, really stress the heart. And it may be that just the overall stress involved in fighting an infection is now causing problems with the heart, having enough blood to maintain that level of activity to moderate that stress and resulting in um, evidence of myocardial uh, damage, troponin elevation, um, and other signs of cardiac dysfunction. And then finally, the third theory that's out there is that um, particularly in patients who have a really vigorous immune response to fight the virus, that one of the inadvertent side effects of that vigorous immune response may be direct myocardial injury as well. And we think this might be mediated through a so-called cytokine storm, where cytokines that uh, in some cases are um, really vigorously expressed in the body fighting the virus can have a bystander effect and cause cardiac dysfunction in that way. So, you know, there's probably a little bit of all three of these things at play. Um, and depending on the patient and their prior comorbidities and sort of how their immune system works, uh, varying things will impact their cardiac disease. But I think our overall statement suggests that these are potential mechanisms and these are patients that tend to be at risk. And so as you're treating them, particularly in the hospital, being mindful of that potential comorbidity and those potential complications on the cardiac side is gonna be a really important thing for the care teams taking care of these patients side of things. Let's talk about the role of thrombosis in COVID-19, because I know you wanted to touch on that. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the topics that we're actively trying to understand now. So we've heard, again, from the field, from anecdotes, which is where a lot of this begins through direct observation, that we're seeing the occurrence of um, thrombosis in patients, both uh, larger clots, sometimes in the venous system, as well as microthrombi. Um, I'm wondering if that's actually a contributor in some cases to the cardiac disease we see. We also know that um, a lot of the inflammatory markers that naturally rise when the body is fighting an infection have prothrombotic properties. Uh, examples are you know, IL-6 or D-dimers or some of these proteins that we know a lot about, um, but just in the setting of a viral illness like this, uh, we're concerned may lead to clotting and then subsequent organ dysfunction from it afterwards. So A, is that true? And we have enough evidence, I think, of other viral diseases like flu, like the prior outbreak of SARS or MERS, that we think it probably is. But the more relevant question is, what do we do about it? You know, for patients who are clotting, say with an acute coronary syndrome or if they have a deep venous thrombosis, it's pretty clear that anticoagulants are the um, mainstay of treatment. But here, uh, we don't have that clear link yet in terms of evidence of efficacy. And we also know that some things are prothrombotic in the inflammatory cascade and some are antithrombotic 
And so by putting a blood thinner or anticoagulation strategy in place, do we inadvertently increase the bleeding risk of our patients to an unacceptable level? We also know that a lot of patients develop this disseminated intravascular coagulation. In general, it's a prothrombotic state, so we typically recommend at least prophylactic doses of anticoagulation, um, but it, it is a complex condition and really trying to understand what's the right balance of therapy versus side effect is an ongoing issue. So we do have uh, some evidence being generated now by some experts in thrombosis. We're putting together their sort of guidance about what they would do in these current situations. And our hope is to have that up on the hub in the next day or two to be able to offer, at least as of today, our best practices. And then of course, continue our uh, investigation, observation, and research to make sure that we can, uh, we can support that with the data behind it.